I'm inviting you tonight as we continue to worship. We sang this song last week, but before we, before we entered into this next time of worship, I wanted to kind of explain to you what it is that you're asking when you sing these words with us, crying out to God to help you to, to lay down your hopes and your dreams for a better plan, a plan that he had prescribed for you long before the foundations of the earth were set in place. Crying out for him to empty our hands and fill up our hearts. Because his ways are higher.
That's our prayer tonight. Empty our hearts and our minds of anything that, that holds us back from hearing your message tonight, from worshiping you with our, our heart, soul, our mind, and our strength. Because you're more to us than, than anything could ever be. We want your will for us more than we want our own because we know that your ways are higher and you, you made us to begin with. You know what we're, we're made for and what we're prepared for better than we could ever imagine. God, I ask that you be with John tonight as he brings your word to us. Speak through him and open our hearts and our minds to the things that you want to say to us. We ask all this in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, worship team. How many of you guys um, are doing the 20-day truth challenge? Anybody in the room doing it with me? All right. If you don't know what that is, then I've, our, I've, we've challenged our church to open the Bible every day for the next 20 days. And our, our pastor here, First Baptist, does a devotional that he puts out on Facebook and emails. Uh, it's easy to find. But here's the deal. This is designed for those that currently are not reading the Bible at all. And we're not here to make you feel guilty, uh, but we're here to help you. And this is a great first step. Two minutes of truth. How many of y'all can carve out two minutes a day? Anybody have two extra minutes a day? Everybody in here has two extra minutes a day, right? Where you can open the Bible and the cumulative effect of those two minutes of truth a day, I think will be significant um, over the course of weeks and months and hopefully years of your life. So you can find me on Facebook. I share that every day. The daily dose is what I've been calling it. Daily dose of truth, two minutes of truth. And I really challenge you, I dare you, uh, to accept the challenge and to open the Bible every day, um, hopefully for indefinite future, but you're only committing to the next, what's today? 18th? 19th for like the next uh, eight, nine days. So, all right, Acts. We've been looking through the book of Acts, and it's been exciting for me, man. I've been getting fired up looking at what God did through the early church because it's the same God. The same God that moved through the early church is the same God that's here tonight. The same God that empowered these ordinary people to do extraordinary things is the same God that's with us as you walk across campus, as you walk across Lubbock, not walk across Lubbock, as you drive across Lubbock, as you go to work, as you go to class, you know, as you go to your chapter meetings on Monday nights, as you go to your study groups, the, as you go to your apartments or your dorms, that's the same God, the same God that lit a fire in the heart of these dysfunctional people and somehow flowed through them to impact the planet. That's the same God that's in you if you're a Christian. Same God that's in me, and that excites me. That fires me up. And we talked earlier, and I can't really shake the, the message from a few weeks ago, that they were devoted. Say devoted. They were devoted. And they, they had committed themselves. They had pushed it all across the table. They had said to God, I'm all in. As much as I, you know, as much as I can from where I'm at, I'm all in. And so that's the key here is being devoted to God, not just a casual Christian, but a committed Christian, somebody that has a fire in their heart for God. And so tonight we come to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, if you have a Bible, turn there with me. We're going to read some of the Bible. You guys cool with to read the Bible for a little bit tonight? Is that all right? Let's just, let's just read the Word. Let the Word speak for itself. I believe the Word has power. I believe my job as a teacher of the Bible is to simply unleash the truth that God has already spoken, right? And the Word is living and active. Did you know that? That the Bible has a pulse? That is God breathed? It says the, the Word is living and active. So here's what happens when you consistently place your life in places where the Bible is open, is that the Word has legs, right? And it walks around the room. So when you unleash the Word, when you open the Bible, when you teach the Bible, it's not my words that are living and active. It's not my words that are going to pierce the heart. It's God's words. And so what we're about to do as we teach the Word of God is the Word of God begins to walk around the room, right? And He comes into your life and He bumps against your life and He does things in your life that I could never do through the Holy Spirit. So Acts chapter 8, let's begin reading in verse 1. So last week, if you missed last week, you can catch the podcast. And basically the summary was you can do everything right and your world could be 
coming undone. You could be doing everything right like Stephen, doing your best to live for Jesus, and yet it seems like from the outside that you're cursed, that you're somehow um, not living your life right. And that's Job, right? Job was the most righteous guy on the planet, and his house got burned down, and his whole family was in it, right? Everything got taken away from him. And so some of you needed to hear that last week, right? Just persevere. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. You hear me? Don't give up. Because at the end of the day, uh, God is worth it. Acts chapter 8, though, here. So Stephen has just been uh, murdered, and Saul was there, approved of the killing. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Hit the pause button. Hit the pause button. Leave your Bibles open, but hit the pause button here for a minute. You have Saul of Tarsus, which he eventually became who? Paul the Apostle. And we'll get to that later. Man, it's awesome that God can take a dude that was burning down churches and use him to build churches. So if you think you're damaged goods, you think that God has written you off, that's not true. Man, if he can use Saul of Tarsus, he can use you, I promise you, right? Because this is hardcore persecution against the church. So it says here that he was kicking down doors and dragging people out. Saul was wreaking havoc. So he's sitting there with his arm crossed and he is overseeing the murder of Stephen. So people dropped their cloaks at the foot of Saul. That means he was approving of what was going down, right? Yeah, go ahead and kill him. They're throwing rocks at the guy until he, until he dies. And now it goes to the next level here. Persecution breaks out. And the word in the Greek when it says that Paul began to destroy the church, that is a very strong word in the original, and it denotes brutal cruelty. The actual word is used of, of an animal ravaging a body. I mean, that is brutal. Like when you get the, the word picture that they're painting here, so it's not Saul going up, <clears throat> hey, I'm just in the neighborhood looking for some Christians. You know, he's not, he, he's not like Mr. Rogers with his cardigan on going from door to door selling Girl Scout cookies. Homeboy is kicking down doors and dragging people out by the hair. Like this is brutal tactics here. Like this is terrorism tactics here. And he's dragging not just the men, but the whole families. He's dragging families out and he's putting them into prison, right? He's dragging them off to jail and he's hoping that they get the same thing that Stephen got. So this is Saul of Tarsus here and it's scary times, man. This is scary times, right? Because there's Christians that are in their living rooms and they have friends and family that have been, their doors have been kicked in and they have been dragged away to jail. Some of them have been beat down, they get their property taken away. You know, in some ways, you know, it's similar to what's happening in some places in the Middle East right now. You know, have you seen the Christian symbol, that, that uh, Arabic symbol that they've been putting on Christian houses and Christian doors, right? They're marking them. And there's persecution going on, right? They're kicking down doors, dragging people out. If you're a Christian, then you're in danger. It's kind of a similar vibe going on here in Jerusalem where all of a sudden it becomes dangerous to be associated with the church. And Saul is leading the charge. But check this out. See how the early church reacts, man. This fires me up. Because I don't know about you, but it's, it's fairly easy right now to be a Christian in our culture, in our time, especially in Lubbock, Texas, where there's so much of kind of the Bible Belt backdrop to living here, where there's churches everywhere, Christian radio stations, Christian t-shirts. And what if, though, there was a price to pay? What if all of a sudden, it wasn't easy to be a follower of Christ. I don't know, but my tendency probably would be to shrink back, right? To say, okay, I didn't really sign up for this, but look at the early church. This is what fueled the worldwide gospel. Is their hearts, they were so devoted, they were so committed, they had pushed it all across the table and said, I'm all in, regardless of what happens. Listen, to, so Saul is wreaking havoc destroying the church or trying to. And then verse four, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. 
This is crazy talk. So these Christians, they, they just, one of their heroes, one of their leaders, one of their captains, Stephen, you know, the guy that had the angel face, the guy that was glowing, uh, an amazing Christian dude just got murdered and now Saul is kicking down doors and dragging people away to jail and you think they would say okay it's time to go covert here it's time to go stealth mode with our faith it's time to kind of cloak it let's just drop off the radar and tone it down is that how you would react I think that's how probably I would react because most of you aren't there yet but I'm in a place right now where I have a wife and kids All of a sudden, I'm looking at my wife and my kids, and I'm thinking, wait, am I willing to let them get dragged out in the street and go to jail? Is my faith worth more than my family? You see, these early Christians, they had heard the hard words of Jesus when he spoke very plainly. He said, if you love your family more than me, then you're not worthy of me. And they had that heart that was devoted regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the persecution. They preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So what caused Philip to go to a place where God moved. It's persecution. It wasn't a worship service, right? It wasn't like Philip was in a paradigm and he was worshiping his face off and God called him out in a moment of worship when he was on the mountaintop, when he's at the youth camp. No, it was the murder of his friend. It was the brutal murder of his friend. It was Saul kicking down doors and dragging off Christians to jail. That was the catalyst for Philip going and doing what he did right here in this town. Pushing back the darkness, casting out demons, healing people, preaching the gospel. And now we get to the the guy, the dude, the homeboy here that I want to talk about tonight, Simon the sorcerer. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They called him, they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So this was a kind of a showdown here, right? It's like Harry Potter, and what's the, the bad guy's name in Harry Potter? Mordor, isn't that Lord of the Rings? Was that, did somebody say Mordor? Voldemort, yeah. I mean, when they had the showdown, right? You know, it's kind of like um, when, when Luke is, you know, like saber fighting Darth Vader, thank you. You know, so you got Philip, you know, and like the forces of good, you have God, and you have Simon and his sorcery, right? And Simon sees the greater power. Simon sees, he senses that Philip has something that is real because Simon's sorcery um, was more of a magic show than miracles. But he goes on here. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria, oh, wait a minute, let me back up. Simon himself believed and was baptized, right? So he looked like he was signing on to the team, but I want you to pay attention to what, how this unfolds here. He followed Philip everywhere. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And by the way, the fact that these Jewish dudes were in Samaria is a whole nother message for another day, right? Because that was like the forbidden zone. You know what I'm saying? That was like, uh, you, you really... Uh, the closest thing I can come to uh, is like an old South, you know, racial, a racial illustration, right? Where it's, it's like, you know, these um, black evangelists going to the plantation to tell them about Jesus. That just, that just didn't happen, okay? 
And that's what they're crossing these cultural lines here. And the gospel does that. The gospel motivates us to do that. So when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that, there might be, that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. You need to underline that. Your heart is not right with God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and you're captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. So he is not contrite. He's not, like, he's not heartfelt repentance. He's just afraid of getting struck by some lightning, right? He's just afraid of getting smote by God. He's afraid, so he's, he's, not, really, he's not really repentant. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel as they went. And we'll talk about that in a minute as we wrap up. Preaching the gospel as they went. So here's this guy, Simon the magician, Simon the sorcerer, and he had a false motive for following. And I really want to ask you, why are you here? As best as I can to a larger group, I want to ask you as an individual, why are you here? What is your motive for attending worship? Because Simon the sorcerer had a false motive for following. And I can't see your heart and you can't see my heart. Let me ask you something. How do you know I'm not a pretender? How do you know that I'm not up here because it makes me feel good about myself to be in the spotlight? How do you know I'm not up here because it really, you know, the influence that I have as a leader is what motivates me. The way it makes me have self-worth and self-esteem, the control and influence that I have. How do you know I'm not a jerk? How do you know? How do you know I don't go home and push around my wife? How do you know I don't mistreat my kids? How do you know I don't cuss out my neighbor? You don't. And that's the scary part. God sees my heart. God sees your heart. So what's your motive? Why are you here? Because, listen, Simon, from the outside and from a distance, he looked legit from a distance. That's the scary part. People look through the stained glass and they see you sitting in a pew or they see me stomping around on the stage waving a Bible, and they say, that dude must be good to go with God. They said the same thing about Simon. They said, that guy is on the right team. He's wearing the Jesus jersey, but he had a false motive for following. He was a pretender. Say pretender. Another word is a charlatan. It's kind of a, that's a funner, it's a funner a, a word. <laughs> that's a fun word to say. Charlatan. He was a charlatan. When's the last time you called somebody a charlatan? It's awesome. Try to use that this week, the rest of this week in everyday conversation. Charlatan or <laughs> whatever. Call somebody out on campus, your professor, whatever. That'd be awesome, right? If you just walked in to your class like five minutes after it started and like in your best like old school voice, maybe even an English accent would make it better, I think. Charlatan! And then walk out. <laughs> maybe you should walk into somebody else's class and not your class. That's what I'm saying. So that they don't know you. <laughs> That'd be even better. Some stranger. It'd be even better, man. This is getting more and more in my mind. If you had like a robe on and some sandals. And a staff. This is getting so good in my mind right now. I know if I was a student in that class, I would very much enjoy that if you would do that. But he was a charlatan. He was a pretender. He was an imposter. Because here's the deal. It was about him. It was not about God. It was not about the kingdom furthering. It was not about pushing back the darkness. It wasn't about providing hope for hurting people. It wasn't about extending the love of God to people that were beat down. It's about him. That was his motive. God was a means to an end. Listen closely, students, because 
Why are you here? What motivates your attendance in worship and at church? Because if you are coming for a motive that is something other than connecting with God, if it's what God can do for you, if you're coming with the mindset of, I'm going to sit in Santa's lap and give him my list. If that's your mindset of God, then I'm, I'm afraid for you tonight because I think you might be walking in the sand, sandals of Simon the sorcerer tonight. If God is a means to an end, if God is just this blessing factory for you, if God is like the drive through window attendant in your life and you just kind of cruise through and you place your order, if that's your mentality, if God is a means to an end and the end is you, what God can do for you, then you got to check yourself because you might be walking in the sandals of Simon. He saw an opportunity, not for God, but for himself, not to further the kingdom, but to build his own castle. And God was a tool in his hand that he could use to improve his popularity. So he, here he was, he was the big dog in the town. He was called the great man, right? What was um, the hockey player uh, like the greatest hockey player of all time? Gretzky. Yeah. What was his nickname? The Great One. Isn't that awesome? Like you walk, in, walk into a restaurant, hey, there's the Great One. That'd be awesome, man. I mean, but that was this dude's nickname in his town, in Samaria. Oh, there's Simon, the Great One. And so he was the great one until Philip rolled into town with the power of God. Now, all of a sudden, Philip was, had legit connection with heaven, power from on high. And Simon's over there, hmm. I kind of imagine him. Have you ever seen um, Aladdin? I'm sorry, guys. I will uh, surrender my man card after the service tonight. But, but uh, you know, Jafar in Aladdin? kind of imagine Simon the sorcerer to kind of have like this Jafar look. He's, you know, he's like stroking his greasy goatee, looking over at Philip saying, hmm. And he's seeing opportunity for himself. Not a contrite heart, not a realization of his own need for grace and saving, but opportunity. It wasn't what he could do for God, but what God could do for him. This is the key distinction here when it comes, he had a false motive for following. There might be some in the room tonight that are walking in the sandals of Simon the sorcerer and you walk into church and it's not about what you can do for God to serve the kingdom. Now it's about what God can do for you. And the moment God stops serving you, you stop attending worship. So your loyalty is directly connected to the benefit package that God is providing. Got to be careful because God does bless us, right? Amen. God blesses us. He blesses us with things. He can bless us with joy, with power, with peace. But that is not the motive for following. His gifts are not what motivate us. They're not what fuel our devotion. It's God himself. It's the giver that motivates our devotion, that fuels our commitment. So Simon the sorcerer, had a false motive for following, and he was devoted to himself. He was envious about how God was using others. He wanted to be in the spotlight. He wanted the attention. He wanted the admiration. And one guy that I thought about when I was studying for this was one of the disciples. Anybody want to guess who I thought about? Had a false motive for following? Which disciple do you think? Judas. Telling you, from a distance, Judas looked legit. From a distance, he looked like he was good to go from God with God. But his heart was not right. Judas had a false motive for following. He was an imposter. He was a pretender. And from a distance, he appeared to be good. However, his heart was not right. Jesus was a means to an end. He was in it for what he could get out of it. And listen, the moment... He stopped making money off the ministry. He began looking for an opportunity to capitalize. So how much was the price tag of his integrity? Do you remember? What was it? How much was it that they paid Judas? 
30 pieces of silver and he sold Jesus out. So he was good to go, man. He was in the crowd whenever the ministry was rolling, when there were multitudes showing up and Jesus was performing miracles and everybody was chanting, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And Judas was right there, man, because he thought he was going to be, he was going to be on the inner circle of the next world leader. That they were going to conquer Rome and man, they were going to have cities that they were going to be over. But the moment he realized that this was going in a direction that was not going to end well for Jesus or people that were connected to Jesus, he checked out. The moment sacrifice was required, he checked out and began looking for an opportunity to profit. And so he betrayed Jesus for money. Religious, listen closely, students, because for the pretenders, for the, for the imposters, for the counterfeit Christians, it would be better for you to not show up than to show up and wear the jersey and not truly know God. Religious pretenders can cause serious damage to the body of Christ and to the cause of Christ. They look and sound good, but eventually they are revealed to be charlatans and pretenders motivated by self-interest. Remember I asked you, what are you full of? Well, the pretenders are full of themselves. It's all about them. It's all about what God can do for them, and it's also all about what other people in the church can do for you. Right? It's all about you getting your needs met. It's all about you, 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 and everything is rotating around planet you. That was Simon the sorcerer. That was Judas. The crowds are never a good indication of real success in ministry. This is just a side note. Is it cool if I just kind of throw y'all a little, a little extra, <laughs> little side note here? So you see people, churches or ministries that have huge crowds. I'm not saying that's always an indication that there's some pretending going on, but I'm saying with Simon the sorcerer, I mean, he had crowds. He had captivated the crowds. He had attendance. He had the fastest growing church in Samaria. Boom. You got to be careful, right? You got to be careful to go with the flow, right? If you're just caught up in the flow and you go where the latest, greatest thing is, man, that's, you'll get caught up in some, some crazy stuff because there's pretenders out there. Do you believe that? Do you believe there's imposters in the church? Do you believe there's imposters that stand behind pulpits? Yeah. Like I told you earlier, students, like um, sometimes we get really good at playing the religious game. And at the end of the day, you can sound good. You can have an emotional response, but God was never a part of it. Never a part of it. So you got to be careful. You got to be discerning about where you're joining your life to, what you're joining your life to. So Simon had a large following. He had a packed house. He had the ability to sway the crowds, to wow the crowds. I read one article about some modern ministries today that have compromised themselves through opulent lifestyles, through these extravagant lifestyles. The, what is that reality show? The Preachers of LA, have you seen that commercial or seen that show? I mean, these, these Benny Hinn type ministers uh, that have like a mansion on the East Coast, a mansion on the West Coast, and you go to, you, you watch some of their stuff and it's, it seems to be all hype and very little substance. You know, it's, it, it's a hard thing, right, to protect people from imposters, but it's a necessary thing, right? There's, there are sheep, there are wolves in sheep clothing, like Simon the sorcerer, like Judas. And because I care for you, I want to I wanna speak the truth to you, that there are people out there that will provide a great experience for you, right? It, you might have a, a, an awesome emotional time, but was God in it? Was God really there? Ministers that live like rock stars, lots of hype, but very little substance. And the New Testament speaks often of this. The, the Bible is very clear about false prophets, okay? 
Virtually every book in the New Testament warns about false teachers and scripture has a great deal to say about how they should be handled. False teachers are to be marked, avoided, publicly rebuked and exposed. That's hard, that's uncomfortable, right? For me, as a ministry leader that has influence in your life, for your good, for me to warn you about other people that are false prophets, right? Because you walk out of here thinking, well, who, is, who does he think he is, right? Does he think he's arrived? No, I don't. But I know there are wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul said this regularly, uh, and he um, he really had some harsh words to say about some false prophets because he cared about the church, man. He cared about the church. And the greatest enemy of the church is not external forces, right? It's not the government. It's not Hollywood. It's not movies, regardless of what Facebook said last week about a certain movie that came out. That's not going to destroy the church, man. You know what's going to destroy the church? It's what we're talking about right now. Heresy, false prophets that are going to come in and you're going to be deceived, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he, t- he, he, um, he goes into a rant here about false prophets. And he says, verse 12, And I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under, from under those that want an opportunity to be, con- be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Now the Bible calls us sheep, right? On the count of three, I want everybody to make a sheep noise. Anybody got a really good sheep impersonation? Is that right? A person... Uh, in sheep a nation on the count of three I want everybody to make a sheep noise all right you ready one two three (laughs) that was kind of like a very sickly sheep (laughs) but that's what we are right we're all sheep which sheep are easily led astray we're easily led astray And Satan's, some of his greatest tactics are to send some Simon the sorcerers into the body of Christ. So he's not going to show up in a black robe with like a pentagram tattooed on his forehead. Right? He's not going to show up with like a goat head. (laughs) Worship the prince of darkness. Uh, No. Somebody dial 911. Because, dude, that is creepy. That's not the way Satan operates, is it? Right? He's not going to roll in here with a pentagram and a goat head and give an altar call. What he is going to do? Listen closely, students. He's going to send in a Simon the Sorcerer that is very charismatic, that can speak well, that is a smooth operator, and that can manipulate and deceive. And you'll be sitting in a group of people. Meh. God, I gotta work on that. Chris, do we have like a, an audio sheep that we could use instead of my weak, sick, sickly, like dying? That's a dying sheep. But hey, listen, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make jokes in the midst of it here, but it's serious business, y'all. This is serious business. You know, let me go back to the, uh, the obvious modern day example. Um, and, and again, it, there's lots of evidence for false prophecy with this dude, with Benny Hinn, right? There are thousands, thousands of people that pack out auditoriums worldwide. And I wonder why they're there. Are they there, are they there because the Word of God is being presented? Are they there because truth is being laid on the table? Are they there for God? Or are they there for themselves? I wonder. False motive for following. Opulent lifestyles, not here for what we can do for God, but what God can do for me at the end of the day. And when things get rough, here's the real test, students. Here's the real test. When things get rough, you, the pretenders, bail out, right? Jesus talks about sacrifice all the time. Sacrifice comes with the territory of the Christ follower. And yet when sacrifice happens for the pretender, they're out. (laughs) 
right? They stump their toe in the parking lot on the way into church. I'm out. Right? They're walking through the door and the greeter somehow doesn't see them. I'm out. Nobody said hi to me. They walk into the sanctuary and it's like five degrees hotter than what they would prefer. I'm out. Right? I'm going to take my Bible and go home. I'm going to go to the church down the road. That's going to cater more to my preferences. Why don't you guys have a barista in the foyer? I'm out. (laughs) I wish your preacher was funnier. I'm out. I wish he wasn't so whatever, fill in the blank. You get what I'm talking about here. It is about you. It's a false motive for following. And when sacrifice is required, you know, you look at, you know, I went to Benny Hinn's website and they have this section where you can give, but he calls it seed money. You sow $250 and God will give you 12 times down the road. So what, what are you really doing, man? You're not giving to further the kingdom. You're making an investment so you can profit. What is up with that? You know, give me your money and God will give you 10 times in return. Who is that about? Is that about God? You're not really interested in building a house for some poor family. You're not really interested in the orphans or the food that that we're providing for hungry people. As long as you get paid. And the moment that God doesn't honor his end of the bargain, you're out. So you got to be careful, students, because these imposters are very persuasive. Very persuasive. So you got to use the Word of God, not your emotions, the Word of God as the ultimate criteria for where you're going to connect your life. Not the latest greatest. I'm not saying the latest greatest is always bad. There's places that are doing right that have huge crowds. But you can't just go with the flow, man. (laughs) Hey, everybody's going over wherever. I just want to jump on the bandwagon. Got to be careful because Satan doesn't show up with a pentagram and a goat head. Oftentimes he shows up carrying one of these. And that's scary. But that's who Simon the sorcerer was. He signed up, he had the jersey, he said he believed, but he never really believed. He wasn't a real, legit follower of Jesus. So, 822, check this out. Let's wrap this up. 822, you got Simon the sorcerer here, and then boom, like Peter lays the truth hammer down on Simon the magician. Boom shakalaka. He drops the, you know, he launches a tomahawk truth missile on homeboy. Like just boom. And, and calls him out in hopes that he would repent. In hopes that he would be convicted. May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and gall. So some translations say it's the intent because of the intent of his heart. And students, tonight that is ultimately what matters to God. is the intent of your heart. So God is not up in heaven keeping religious attendance. He's not putting gold stars by your name because you show up at some religious real estate every now and again. What concerns God is the state of your heart. That's what would concern God with Simon the sorcerer, right? It was the intent of his heart. His heart wasn't right with God. And when your heart is right with God, you're going to love others. You will put the needs of others above yourself. This is called sacrificial love. This is one of the prime evidences that God has changed your heart is now all of a sudden, it's no longer about you Now it's about him. He must become greater. I must become less. God's in the spotlight. You're building the kingdom, not constructing your personal castle. 
It's the intent of the heart that got Simon the sorcerer in trouble. And soon as tonight, there might be somebody here that's walking in the sandals of Simon the sorcerer because your heart is not right with God. And you're here not for what you can do for God, but what God can do for you. He's a means to an end. And the moment God stops handing out the candy, guess what? You're out. And so love is the ultimate test. When someone asks you how your spiritual life is going, it's from a quote from a Bible study. When someone asks you how your spiritual life is going, the real question is, are you becoming a more loving person towards God and people? Regardless of any other measure, how you stand up against that statement will reveal your true spiritual stature. This measurement is the supreme diagnostic for Christ followers. Are you becoming a more loving person? Is it more and more about him and less and less about us? That is the supreme spiritual diagnostic. Last here, let's wrap this up in verse 25. Check this out. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan village. They proclaimed as they went. And here's the key for the Christ followers in the room tonight, right? Mission is not a trip, it's a lifestyle. And so it's not they didn't have the mindset of I'm going to Samaria to do ministry there. They were ministers. And so they did ministry along the way. So it's not us going to New Orleans over spring break and helping the people there. It's as we get ready to go, you're on mission along the way. It's amazing to me sometimes that, you know, you're in a restaurant or wherever in Lubbock and you could care less about your waiter or your waitress, right? Or you're on campus doing whatever, but you put yourself on a mission trip and all of a sudden everything becomes an opportunity, right? You're in a, let's say you're in, the, in Chili's in Lubbock and Chili's in New Orleans. Like, and you're on a mission trip, now all of a sudden you're praying, hey guys, let's pray for our waitress. You know, I just feel like we need to ask her if there's anything we can pray for her about, right? And so you're all getting together and like, hey, let's pray for her. She comes over. Hey, how's it going? We're here from West Texas. You know, Woo-hoo. and how's it going today? Is there any way I can pray for you? You know, we're just about to, we're about to thank God for our food. And man, I'm so glad you're here to bring us our food. And uh, we're just about to pray. And so we have this mindset, you know, like when you're on a mission trip, everything becomes an opportunity. Like you're sitting on a bus in New Orleans and the person sitting beside you, now all of a sudden you're thinking, man, God sent that person, right? To my seat beside, to the seat beside me, right? I need to encourage him. I need to somehow bless him, share the love of Christ with this dude, with this girl. Now you come back to Lubbock, like 24 hours later, you go to Chili's, right? And they get your order wrong and you are, what's wrong with you, waitress? You are a horrible person. (laughs) You probably, you probably like kick puppies. Like, I mean, you're just, you're, I mean, you're a different person. It's It's the same restaurant, different city. This is the mindset. This is the mindset that fueled the worldwide spread of the gospel, man, is that they had the mindset of, I'm not going to church. I am the church. I am not going on a mission trip. My life is a mission. As you walk across campus, you live like a sent person wherever you go, right? So God sent you into that class because there's somebody in there that needs to know they matter to him. And he sent you as a missionary into biology 101. You think you joined that fraternity or sorority so that you could find some friends? But as the Christian, God sent you there because there is some dude in that fraternity, some girl in that sorority that need to know that they matter to God, that their existence matters to somebody. And he sent you there as a missionary. Your degree programs, your study groups, your workout class, you think you're there to get in shape, but getting in shape is just a byproduct of the mission. 
the weights, the CrossFit, the whatever, that's just an excuse for you to interact with people. Not in a weird way, right? But in a legitimate way where you're there for a legitimate reason. You understand what I'm saying? They, they, they preached as they went. They shared the light, the love, the grace as they went. Unscripted encounters, unplanned opportunities on mission all the time. I wonder, I wonder what kind of difference we could make in this community and on our campuses if everybody in this room committed to have this heart, to have this mindset, right? To say, I'm going to live like a sent person. Not some weirdo religious freak, you know, that's standing up on campus, you know, just preaching at folks. But I'm talking about the dude in your study group, the girl in your sorority that's lonely, that's desperate for hope. And they're sitting six feet away from you. They're sitting right there. And Jesus wants to reach through your life and let them know they matter to him. He wants to speak through your lips and bring hope. And I wonder what kind of impact we would make if all of us in here left like we were sent. Man, think about that. The difference that we could make, the light that we could shine, the hope that we could bring to Texas Tech. How many different degree programs are represented in this room tonight? How many different intramural teams are represented in this room? How many different dorms and apartments? And y'all work all over the place. Some of y'all have multiple jobs in different parts of the city. You're all over the place. What if we went wherever as a sent person, right? Open your eyes and see the people that are sitting right in front of you. That mindset is what fueled the tidal wave of the early church that swept over the planet. It wasn't amazing, powerful preaching. These guys were fishermen, man, with calluses on their hands. These guys were blue-collar workers. Yes, they had spent three years with Jesus, but at the end of those three years, they were still, huh, they were still struggling pretty hardcore. And yet God was with them. It wasn't the amazing music. It wasn't the amazing teaching. It wasn't the amazing programs. It wasn't the incredible small groups. It wasn't the social justice programs. It was the regular ordinary Christians that were devoted to God, that were committed to Christ, and that the persecution became the catalyst for the spread of the gospel. They were fearless. They lived by faith and not by fear. And they changed the world. And I have to believe in my heart tonight, students, that the same God can take same ordinary broken people and still change the world today. If we, if we allow our hearts to be fully committed and devoted, that we have that mindset that I don't care what happens. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no matter what. No matter what happens, you're going to live your life for what matters most. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the example of the early church and how challenging it is for me, how encouraging it is for us. You can take a group of regular, broken, ordinary people and change the world. Thank you for being that kind of God that uses people like us somehow by your grace. And I pray for the pretenders in the room tonight. I pray for those that are following you through false motives. I pray for the imposters, these counterfeit Christians. I pray that they get their hearts right tonight, to get their hearts right with you tonight, to push it all across the table and say, God, as best as I can from where I'm at, I'm all in. Because guess what? He's all in for you. How do we know that? Because we're pushing our chips across the table in the shadow of the cross where the Son of God was tortured and murdered. That's what motivates our sacrifice. Not what we can get from God, but what God has already done for us.
through the gospel, through the cross, through Jesus. And if we never got a one, if we never got one other thing from God, if all he ever did for us was purchase our soul through the blood of his son, then that's way too much for my dirty, polluted, twisted self. So I pray tonight, God, that you'll search our hearts, search our hearts and help us as best as we can from where we're at to push it all across the table and say, God, I'm all in. I want to have a devoted heart, a committed heart, and to walk out of here as a sent person, to light up our campuses with the love of God. In Jesus' name. Just sing this chorus with me. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough.
If you would, please go ahead and come forward, and the rest of you guys can be seated and turn your attention to the screen. My name is Kelsey, and I'm a junior here at Texas Tech, and I'm in my second semester of nursing school at the Health Sciences Center, and I'm from Longview, Texas, which is two hours east of Dallas, almost Louisiana. I started looking at tech my junior year of high school, um, honestly because it was kind of far away from home and I wanted to get out of East Texas, but it really has a great nursing program and that was a big priority for me. And I applied to several other schools and then when I came to visit tech I just didn't want to go anywhere else, so that's how I ended up here. My freshman year, the first Sunday that came about after I moved into my dorm, I decided to try First Baptist just because I've been raised in a Baptist church my whole life and totally intended on like church hopping until I found one that I liked and came here that first Sunday and never went anywhere else. So I've been here for three and a half years now. I would say a quirk of mine is just that I'm super OCD. Like if you were to ask my roommates and it's about random things, if I see the clock end on a nine, I have to watch it turn to a whole number. Like if it's 8.59, I have to watch it turn to nine o'clock. So uh, can you tell me I'm sorry, can we wait a second? I'm waiting on the clock to turn. Oh. It's gonna be a minute. Okay. Like 10 more seconds. Okay, we're good. I know that's weird, but yeah. My friend in high school used to like set her oven timer permanently to that and I would, it would drive me crazy. Um, if you smack gum around me, that's kind of my pet peeve. Just, I will ask you to like spit it out or keep your mouth closed. I don't like to hear people's saliva moving around. It just is gross and not necessary, so yeah. 
something you should know about John if you don't know him at all. Obviously, he's a coffee addict. He drinks it with like six espresso shots. Like, I don't know how the man's eyeballs don't jitter when he's talking because it's just so much caffeine. On the way back from Passion, he was like drinking cold coffee because he it was like sitting in the car for a long time, but he still needed the caffeine. So he was just drinking it. So it's kind of definitely an addiction. <laughs> This is also kind of a quirk, but it's a weird hobby. When I'm really stressed out, my absolute favorite thing to do is to go get a car wash. <laughs> it's really relaxing, so I probably get like one or two a week, and even if it's not dirty, like if I'm had a bad day, I'll just go get a car wash. Um, so it's not really a hobby, but just something I do. Um, other than that, I love, love, love movies. If you ever want to see a movie, I'm your girl. To all the girls in the room, if you guys ever um, need anything, want to hang out, want to get coffee or lunch or anything, I love to do those things and would love to make myself available to you. Um, my email is going to be on the bottom of the screen right here. If you just want to shoot me an email or come find me after the service or anytime you see me, um, I'd love to hang out with you. My freshman year, I joined a community group, and at the end of that, my community group leader asked me if I'd be interested in applying to be a community group leader. And my first question to her was, am I old enough to do that? I'm 18 years old, that's crazy, you want me to lead people? Um, but she kind of made me um, fill out an application, and so I interviewed for that, and had a really fantastic experience with that last year. And this year, I um, was a community group leader again last semester, and then at the end of the semester, um, just really felt like I had more to offer to the ministry and um, this internship offer was presented to me and I decided, prayed about it for a long time, talked to a few people about it and decided it was the right fit. 930 for me coming into it was just a place where I found people that genuinely cared about me and about their own relationship with Christ and seeing my relationship with Christ grow and that's what I hope that our students find through the leaders that we have, not just myself or Ty or John or our life group leaders or community group leaders, but I hope they find that within themselves and find the ability to help other Christians grow in their faith as they're growing in theirs simultaneously.